joy to be with you this morning, church. Thankful for God's provision for this day and this space to meet, study His good word. You grab your Bibles with me and turn to the letter of 1 John as we continue our sermon series through this great letter. God has provided for us His good, righteous, holy word. Today we're in 1 John chapter 3. 23 through 24, and we will conclude chapter 3 um, today as we prepare to move into chapter 4. In this last few verses of chapter 3, John recaps three major points of emphasis that he's spoken of so far in the letter and will really continue to drive home. And those are belief, love, and obedience. Look with me at our passage and you will see these clearly unfold. 1 John chapter 3, 23, 24. And this is the commandment that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. Church, what a blessing to have God's Word, to get to study it like we do. Dive in with me to this text, the opening parts here of 23. Right out the gate, we see a super important just clarity of life. And that is to understand the command of God on all creation is to believe in Him, to trust in Him, to honor Him. Why? Because it is what He is due from His creation. It is right. It is the right response of the creation to the Creator. Think about that. There is nothing more right than to give God what God is due. Respect and honor, faith and obedience. In this, you could confidently proclaim that believing into God or Said differently, trusting your entire life to God is the highest purpose of one's life. The Holy Scriptures say that this is such an important priority for the moment-by-moment life of mankind that anything we do or say that is outside of faith in God is sin. The Apostle Paul says clearly in Romans 14, 23, whatever whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Don't miss the overwhelming nature of this verse. If faith in God is not the origin of our activity, then it is sin. The reason this is so penetrating is that it goes to the root of all sinful actions and attitudes, namely a fundamental failure to trust God. The the original language gives emphasis to this even more. It says, everything which is not from faith is sin. Everything, anything, any act, any attitude which is not done in true faith unto the glory of the one true God, is sin. I I think sometimes we hear that, and we're overwhelmed by it, and then our flesh is quick to kind of be dismissive of it, because it feels so unattainable. To really live there? But that's still too much of a focus on us. I want the truth here 
I want what you're captivated by is to, is to be focused on Him. And that it is right that He is due our total and complete faith all the time. Despite what we face. Despite what we're in the middle of by His providence. Church, God looks beyond the action. He looks to the heart. He looks to the motivation of what we do or say. All pervasive fault in every sin is in its core unbelief. But by unbelief, I I don't mean mere refusal to accept the truths of the Bible. One is not saved by from their sin by simply giving mental assent to the promises of God. No, we're saved by whether we hope with our hearts and trust with our lives the priorities and truths of God. The the failure of the heart to be confident in the promises of God and to rejoice and find pleasure in all that He is, is the root, the essence of our sin. Hebrews 11.6 Without faith, it is impossible to please God. If you can hear my voice today, You must believe into Jesus Christ alone if you will be saved. John's words at the end of his gospel testimony, John chapter 20, 30 through 31, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, all that has been written in the gospel of John, the testimony of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Belief in Jesus is what God uses to change His people, to transform us. The moment we truly and fully believe in Jesus is the moment we stop trusting ourselves or hoping in anything else, all the things we can put our hopes in for a future, for a better life, for salvation. It's the moment we trust our entire lives to the only one who can truly save us and set us free from our bondage to sin, Jesus Christ. This is not just belief about Jesus. It's belief into Jesus Saving faith, belief, is personal trust in Christ. Not just belief about Christ. A lot of people who hang their hat on thinking they're good with God because they believe about God or about Christ. It is possible to believe something to be true with no personal commitment to or dependence involved in it. This is why the word trust is often used to capture what is meant by the word faith or belief. This fuller sense of a personal trust is indicated in several passages of John's Gospel, which in which initial saving faith is spoken of in very personal terms. There's unique personal terms used. Analogies drawn from personal relationships, like when John says in John chapter 1, verse 12 of his gospel, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. Much as we would receive a guest into our homes, John speaks of receiving Christ to rule our lives. 
Salvation comes to the sinner through receiving Christ, that is, believing on his name. Like I said above, not just believing about him, but believing into his name. This is what John is saying in our passage today, 1 John 3, 23. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. Why does John emphasize belief in the name of Jesus? And, and even just the few passages we just saw a moment ago, that emphasis is there. It's to give weight to who you are believing into. His name is Jesus. Back then, names served to capture much more meaning about who a person was than they do today. The name Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. It means Yahweh saves. It is the name of God, Yahweh. And what God came to do to save His people from their sin. God's name, Yahweh, is not a name to be taken lightly. It is full of power and wonder. The name describing God's eternal power and unchangeable character. It's almighty rule. So when we see the big picture of who God is, then the amazing truth that Yahweh saves undeserving sinners like you and me because of the life, death, and resurrection of His only begotten Son, Jesus This is absolutely amazing when God gives us clear eyes to see and savor it. His name is Jesus. Oh, church, there is nothing that compares to the name Jesus. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, That whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. John uses this surprising phrase. He doesn't simply say, whoever believes Him. That is, whoever believes what He says is true. But rather, whoever believes in Him. The Greek phrase, better translated, believes into Him. With a sense of trust or confidence that goes in into and and rest on the person, Jesus. Believing into Jesus is a trusting Him with all of your life. It's putting all your life on Jesus. When you do this, you, you don't also trust your life or parts of your life to your investments or to the relationships you've built or come to love, or to your abilities to perform, succeed. We don't hedge our bets. No, it's all on Him. You are all in on Jesus alone. We trust in Christ alone to be saved. If you've spent time with me as a preacher, you've heard me share a story about Blondin, the, the, the tightrope walker. He's a famous French tightrope walker in the 1800s. And it's just one of those tellings that just makes the point so well. So I, as tempted as I am to feel the need to find a new story to tell you, I, my change was not broken. He would do amazing things on the tightrope and stretch cable over insane spaces. Scary, deadly spaces. Long, deep. Crowds would gather. They'd watch him do amazing things. They'd watch him do tricks. They'd watch him lay down. They'd... He just had such control on the wire. And and one of those famous moments to fill a a wheelbarrow full of bricks. 
and, and so easily wheel it across the wire. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of weight. No problem. And then to call out to the crowd, who believes a, a, a man weighing less than the bricks could get in the wheelbarrow and I could, I could wheel him across the wire? And the crowd went nuts. Yeah, I want to see that. I believe you can do it. Okay, who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? And all the hands went down and everyone got quiet. Do you see the difference in the belief? To believe he can do it is different than to get in the wheelbarrow and put your whole life in his hands. That's saving faith. We, we give Christ all of us. We don't hedge our bets. We don't put a percentage on another number or on another facet of life. It's all Christ or it's nothing. The true believer is one who lives their life trusting and believing into Jesus. We walk by faith in Christ. I'm in His hands. It be- my life belongs to Him. This is faith at work. Acts 16, 30-31, He brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And so what happens there is not just I believe Him. No, it's to take all of what you've banked on and no longer bank on it, but to put it all on Christ. My whole life. Do you believe into Jesus Christ? Not only to save you, but to be the Lord of your entire life. Church, I want us to grow in depths of maturity of faith. And, and, and the Lord has been gracious to, I think, allow us to do this in recent seasons. We're, we're understanding faith not just as a religious term, not just in a passing way. We're climbing into the depths of really what it means. Your faith in Him means you now live for Him. You love like Him. You obey Him in all you do. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus. True Christians, those who are truly redeemed, the saved ones of God, Believe in Jesus alone for salvation and all of life. But the verse doesn't end there. Listen as John continues. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he has commanded us. What causes us to love one another so uniquely in the body of Christ? Love one another. The answer is the love of God at work in and through us. His amazing love. His satisfying love. Psalm 36, 7 through 9, the King James Version reads this way How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Soak up that. How excellent. Excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Christian, is that where you live? Is that your heart? Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. And they shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. And thou shalt make them to drink of the river of thy pleasures. 
For with thee is the fountain of life. And in thy light shall we see light. The love and the kindness that God is, is so precious. What do you, Christian, what do you, what are you moved by lately? What, what are you captivated in? What, what is that thing you can't stop thinking about? I pray that it would growingly be to see the depths of the love and kindness of God towards you. And, and, and you're knocked over by it. You're moved. Under the wing of God, we're satisfied. Secure. The fatness, the abundance, the spillover of the love of God, the satisfaction of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within itself runs over and we shall drink and we shall be pleased. In it we shall have and know life and love. Amen? Amen. Later, 1 John 4.19, John is going to famously say, We love because He first loved us. We can get overly focused on the command to love one another, and take it on as a religious duty, whereby we're trying to muster up what we need to do it well, and many days we don't do it well. Or, we can encourage and pray for and reorient each other to Christ, to God's Word, to these amazing truths that illuminate the depth of the love God has for us, and, and to bathe in them, to, to soak to drip the overflow of that love of God in us will produce a love for one another that can't touch our effort to love one another it, it, it's, there's no comparison it, God's love overflowing in us is so amazing we love because he first loved us commandment is to believe in him to love one another that that loving one another comes out of the overflow of what it means that we have him that we know him if you remember Paul speaks to this well in Ephesians chapter 5 1 through 2 enjoyed thoroughly our three-year season of preaching through Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It's on the website if you've come in to join us recently and missed that. Uh, Ephesians 5, 1 through 2. Therefore, Paul says, be imitators of God as beloved children, children who are loved by God, and, and he says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a, f- a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What does it mean to imitate God? To imitate is to copy, it's to simulate. It's the Greek word used here. Mimetis is where we get our word mimic. Be imitators, be mimics of God. The entirety of Christian living can be summed up in this one statement. Be imitators of God. Or in the New Testament phrasing often used is to grow in Christ-likeness. Many theologians and commentators will say this call to be imitators of God is the highest standard in the world. 
the sum of all duty, the ultimate ideal, to quote some of, of them. To be an imitator of God is to act like God who is holy and just and loving. What we must see clearly, church, is that this is not a call to imitate the incommunicable attributes of God as they are simply and fully unattainable by created mankind. These things are for God alone. Self-existence, self-sufficiency, eternality. We will never be able to attain these things. They belong to God alone. No, Paul's call to imitate God is, is in the communicable attributes of God. His moral attributes as love, wisdom, mercy, goodness, kindness. And so I ask you in this, Christian, what, what is the ultimate bar? What is your ultimate bar for living? What's the ultimate standard by which we must live? The bar is the holy perfection of God. There is nothing in no one who is greater and more perfect. The standard for created man is the Creator Himself. So let me ask you, what is your standard for living? What are your eyes on? What is your target? Do you simply want to be a good person? If so, by what standard do you evaluate or decide what is a good person? You want to look like your father or mother, maybe someone else you look up to. If we belong to Christ, our goal for living needs to be imitators of God. It needs to be becoming more and more like Christ. This is why God prescribed the spiritual discipline of discipleship as a central focus of the new covenant church. This is why we renamed our historic 133-year-old church Disciples Church. Jesus came to them, said to them, commissioned them. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus' words to the disciples in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The commission our Lord gave us, that the orders we've received from our general, the purpose of our days as those belonging to Christ, is to be disciples so that we can make disciples of of Christ, both here in Bakersfield and to the ends of the earth. The core purpose of Christian discipleship is becoming more and more like Christ. A disciple is someone who adheres to the teachings of another. A follower, a learner, an understudy. Applied to Christianity, a disciple is someone who is trained to be like Christ. It's training. It's the very thing Paul emphasized that we as the church are to do and and to practice in Ephesians 4.13, to grow to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What Paul clarifies in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Discipleship is not so that you can be like your disciple maker, but so you can imitate and follow them, cherish their wisdom and maturity and counseling God to better be like Christ. Some Christians over the years have wrongly declared, no, discipleship is not for me. I like a lot of the other parts of the Christian faith. See with me that this attitude is a prideful or lazy way to say, what God has commissioned me to do and be part of is not what I want to do. I'm not interested in being coached or pressed into greater layers of Christ-likeness. That's the attitude behind a rejection of discipleship. Now, while leadership discipleship, the deep training we do to raise up leaders in the church, might not be uniquely for you, every Christian is to be discipled. A multi-layer experience that God has set up in the New Testament church. Part of that's even happening here on a Sunday morning as you sit under the faithful teaching of your shepherds. 
growing in God's truths on Wednesday nights and walking with others in community to be accountable, to be known. Every Christian is to imitate God. And God's design for us is that we don't do this on our own. Christian, you don't belong to yourself. You belong to Christ. You, you are to imitate God. You will stagnate without the God-given ways that He's given you to grow in righteousness so that you can do this, so you can imitate Him. Now all of this gets to the point that Paul and John are both making, and that is, only in God do we know true love. And out of the overflow of God does the church then love one another. Here are Paul's words again, Ephesians 5, 1 through 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ has loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Paul says, walk in love. In other words, our love for one another has to have feet. It, it can't just be a good idea or a lofty ideal. Love has to be real, it has to be present. It's an unavoidable force at work. If the church is going to do anything for God's fame and eternal glory, we must be about love, and specifically want love for one another. It's simply not an option. I mean, Paul talks about the failure of those who, who do great things but don't love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1-3, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. If we are to imitate God, church, and walk in His love, then we are to love not as the world does, but as Christ loved us. This is Paul's clarity, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. How did he give himself up for us? He said himself, John 15, 13, greater love is no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. I want to point out the love of God is shown not only in the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ on the cross, but in his incarnation too, 2 Corinthians 8, 9 for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. So that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Whew. Praise God. See Christ's love move to take on flesh. To humble himself, to be poor. So that in his sacrificial love, we would become spiritually rich. There's so many modern forms of idolatry that are perpetuated in our modern society. Even much of it caught up in the American dream. Temporary. Things that can rust and be stolen. No, our richness needs to be in the Spirit and God in what is eternal. Christ modeled this sacrificial love for the disciples. Gospel of John, chapter 13, 12 through 15. He had, when he had washed their feet, put on his outer garments, and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Church, if we are truly submitted to Jesus as Lord, we will follow Him and live like Him and love like Him. In this, we will continue the work He modeled and began. We will point others to Him as we live like Him and love like Him. I love Piper's quote. On this, on these words of Christ, 
to the disciples, this model he's given us. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. In other words, I have a high standing, a high rank in relationship to you. If I then, your Lord, your teacher, have washed your feet, if I from my high standing have gone low in serving, you also ought to wash one another's feet. You also ought to go low. Two, for I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. This is really clear, he says. Jesus is high, his rank is high, his standing is high, and therefore by ordinary standards of this world, he should be served. Instead, he contradicts the ordinary standards of this world and serves. From his height, he goes low. From his high standing, he goes low to lowly serving. Do we desire to love like Jesus or do we make excuses? Are we guilty too often of pulling rank? Church, it needs to be our privilege to follow our Master's example unto sacrificial love. We're all too quick to evaluate is this person worthy of this? Or have I not done enough good things today that I need to now also do this? I want the heart of the servant leader, Jesus Christ, to motivate my sacrificial service to others in real joy. Jesus is saying, imitate me. Imitate me. We are to be imitators of God. Jesus' example is not to give us the specific washing of people's feet. Some in the church have overswung to go, okay, then we just do that. But it is his humility of a life that is ready to go low in contradiction to all earthly standards and expectations. We do this in sacrificial love for others. God's sacrificial love at work in us. The late great theologian A.W. Pink said it well. As ever ready as we are to lift up the skirts of a brother and say, see how soiled his feet are. But much exercise of soul, much judging of ourselves is needed for such lowly work as this have to get down to my brother's feet if I am to wash them. That means the flesh in me must be subdued. Consider this. If the greatest could minister to the least how much more should we who are lesser minister to our equal? Jesus is shouting with his actions. This is how we love one another in my kingdom. No more selfishness. No more pride. Death to ego. No more excuses. No more entitlement. Just other-centered, sacrificial love. What would the world look like if the church did a better job of sacrificially loving than we did than all of our complaining about what we don't like about the world. Let's put to work, starting with one another, what he's done in us, and not find ways to hang it on the hook and get back to it later, because I got more temporary problems to work out.
finally, in Paul's words here, I just I don't want to move on without saying it. So rich, the sacrificial love Christ showed us that we are to live out is what glorifies God. Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ has loved us, gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Church, we exist to glorify God now and forever, to make much of his name and his fame, to honor and obey him. Church, see with me that your sacrificial love, the evidence of Christ at work in and through you, is what a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God looks like. See with me, when we do these things, it's not ultimately even for the person we serve or for those even watching, although it blesses them abundantly to see the gospel testimony at work. It is ultimately to the glory of God, to the audience of one. Why do we go low in serving others and do the very thing we don't want to do in our flesh? Why do we sacrifice to the person who doesn't deserve it? Why do we put away our excuses when we're tempted to make it all about us and to do what is good for others? Because it is a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It's one thing for us to do this when things are going well. And everything's kind of all lined up. But I think the best parts of this testimony, the sweetest aroma of that sacrifice is when many things in our life are not going well for us. And this is still Christ at work in me. When I'm tempted to reason why I want to make it about me and what I want, I feel a little justified in that. That we wouldn't, Christian, that we'd still say, how is this, how do I love others? And this is the commandment, this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. True Christians, the redeemed, the saved ones of God, must believe in Jesus alone and love one another as he has commanded us and done for us. Look with me now at verse 24. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. John is surely building on Jesus' teaching in places like John 14, 15, when Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's the evidence of belonging, of real love for Christ, is obedience to his commandments. What John and Jesus are pressing here is super simple and yet often ignored in the Christian faith. The byproduct of true, true love and faith in God is devotion to Him, belonging, obedience. To say you love something and then not to be devoted to it is just a testimony of great hypocrisy. Right? I, I've used simple examples to model this for you before. If I tell you I love baseball and you never see me engage in anything having to do with baseball, then do I really love it? If I say I, I love my spouse and then I live in a constant state of unfaithfulness to my marriage vows, do I really love my spouse? Say that you love your job, but you don't really show up. You put in the minimum to just to get through. Do you really love your job? It's simply not true love if not backed up with your life, with your devotion. You can't love Jesus and disregard the fact that He's God. And therefore, He must be obeyed. To say you love Jesus as Savior, but not Jesus as Lord, is to not know Jesus. To 
to know God and to love Him means you will submit to Him. To love and abide in God is to love His rule and authority in your life, and that therefore you'll keep His commandments. Percy Hayward, Bible scholar, late 1800s, early 1900s, Christian contemporary, A.W. Pink, J.C. Ryle, spoke to this very point. All sentimental talking and singing about love are vain, useless by grace. Oh, and I'm sorry, unless by grace we show a truthful obedience. Let me read it again. I butchered it. All sentimental talking and singing about love are vain, unless by grace we show a truthful obedience. There's a lot of people out there who say they love God, they, they love Jesus. They've got no commitment to His Word, to growing in it. A faithful Christian wants to grow in the knowledge of the Word, the application of the Word. They want to be a part of the church. Percy Hayward says there's more hypocrisy than we suppose. Love is practical or it's not love at all. Unless by grace we show a truthful obedience. Beloved, do, we do not earn the love of God. We cannot. It's only because of grace that we have His love. We do not obey so that we can be accepted by God. That's not the gospel. That's religion. That's a hurdle we'll never fill, fulfill. We obey because the Spirit is within us. This is His point. Causing us to abide in God now and forever. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God and God in Him. And by this we know He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. In my sin, and my enslavement to sin, I had no longing to serve God, honor God, obey God. But in salvation, the Spirit comes on board. I want to honor Him. I want to live for Him. I I love His righteous rule in my life. The evidence of our new birth in Christ and abiding in God is our obedience. Our ongoing obedience is the evidence of the Spirit within. The Old Testament prophecy spoken in Ezekiel 36, 27, 25-27. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. See it? And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. This is why our complaining, our our yelling at the lost world around us to obey God, to do what's honoring to God, in many ways is skipping the biggest step. No, they need Jesus. They need the gospel. They need a new birth. They need a new will. They need the Spirit within them to honor God and obey His commands. The good news is, when God regenerated your heart, Christian, your longings changed. And this increases over time with maturity and sanctification. Your desire to please the Lord is more and more. Even in the midst of life's hard moments, you you wake up, you think about it, and the, the thought is, I want to honor God in this. He's my aim. He... He's why I'm even in the middle of this. Let me do this in a way that honors Him. So Christian, we don't pull Him out of it. We don't just make it about that thing that we're in. Struggle at work. Relational fallout. Body is failing or not working. We need not make it about us. Our pleasure is in Him. Our hope is in Him. My my desire is to obey Him. You want Him to rule over you. You want His authority over you. His commands are not a burden to you. Now, 
a true Christian may backslide for a moment or even a season. But a true Christian, in the end, will submit to God, will repent, and abide in Him forever. Why? Because the heart's been changed. The good tree cannot produce a lasting crop of bad fruit. If it does, it proves to not be a good tree at all. An unconverted tree may say they belong to Jesus, but their fruit or lack of faithful, lasting obedience says otherwise. 1 John 3.24 Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he's given us. We've spent a lot of time, John has spent a lot of time on this point of abiding in God, God abiding in us. It's, it's helped my thinking, my walking, my praying for you, for myself, for my family, that, that abiding is where I'm living. I pray that's at work in you. Let me remind us again, as God's Word is reminding us again, Jesus, the word abide means to stay fixed, to continue on course, to endure, to remain. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. To abide is to stay plugged into the source of life, which is Christ himself. We do not thrive in the Christian life by turning away or unplugging. It is... In these seasons that we drift, that we wonder, that we complain, that we slow down, we we savor sin instead of Jesus. To abide is to remain constantly on Christ, pondering His Word, acting for His glory and will, living out who He is in you. We are always desperate for Him. Why the branch and the vine metaphor are so wonderful. The, the branch is so useless to produce fruit without the vine. It doesn't hug up on the rock or the fence and grow some sweet oranges. It doesn't work that way. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. We're desperate for Him alone. Only He is sufficient. Praise God that God has chosen to graft us in, to make us truly apart for apart from him we can do nothing nothing good or God honoring so I ask you how are you abiding in God in all things how is the spirit at work in you how is your belonging to Jesus producing a life of obedience a love for others a walking by faith and we have to see it fuller than I think sometimes we do. Not elementary, but deep. And Paul says it so well in just one verse in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. How often in a day, Christian, are you tempted to make it about you? And and then out of that is where all the junk comes from. You're guilty of being overly focused. Say, Here's what I want. Here's how I want this to go. Christian, slay that mindset with the truth that you have been, you have been crucified with Christ.
So, so I don't take messages anymore from the skeleton hand in the grave to do it the old way. No, that, that me is crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you see how Paul did it right there again? There's a reminder to the soul of that rich, satisfying love of God. Don't do this, Christian. Try to love one another, obey His commands, walk by faith and not by sight. Don't do it on your own accord. Don't try harder. No, bathe in His love. Abide in the vine. Know and love Christ who will move you, who will produce the fruit of the Spirit, who will mature you into Christ-likeness. First John 3, 23-24. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God and God in Him. And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. Consider with me, church, all that we have seen and heard John emphasize and essentially re-emphasize in these two verses. We who belong to Christ, we who abide in God, who possess the Holy Spirit, practice three essential things. We believe into Jesus. We love one another. And we obey God's commandments. Christian, is this true of your life? Are these fundamental markers of how you live your day-to-day life? May it be so. By God's grace and for His glory.